All right, for this video, I want to go over the Form 1099-C, and this is going to be for the 2023 tax year. And we want to cover how to report the 1099-C on your income tax return with the IRS Form 982. So the 982 can be used if you have canceled debt income and you are trying to exclude some or all of that income from your taxable income. So we'll cover the 982, and it is part of the full 1040 for the taxpayer, so we'll go over all the forms and schedules. Uh, and then, of course, we'll cover the 1099-C in more detail, how this information is inputted. And then we also have the IRS publication 4681, which covers these canceled debts. And we'll need a reference to this for the insolvency worksheet that we're going to be looking at. And then we do have uh, one slide here covering some background on this canceled debt income and the exclusion and some details on the fact pattern. And then lastly, I have a insolvency worksheet for our taxpayers. So we'll go through all of this in more detail after we cover the fact pattern. So let me go on the slide first and then we'll look at the Excel workbook and then see how everything is entered on the return. So the 1099-C, this is filed by a creditor. So it's somebody that you owed money to when it forgives debts, either full or partial amounts, uh, that are being owed by that debtor, right? Now the 1099-C, like all other 1099s, it's filed with the IRS, and you, as the recipient, get a copy as well. And so you use this information to complete your tax return. Now, under Section 61A of the, of the tax code, Gross income specifically includes the discharge of indebtedness. So if you have canceled debt income, that is gross income that should be included with your tax return and subject to tax unless an exclusion applies. Right Now, one of the more popular ways to kind of exclude this debt is to claim insolvency. Now, insolvency doesn't mean you went through bankruptcy court. Right, anybody can be insolvent uh, simply by looking at the makeup of their liabilities and their assets. Right, and so in this example, what we're going to look at is a taxpayer that's insolvent, and insolvency generally means that your liabilities exceed your assets immediately before that debt cancellation. And we're going to look at that worksheet in the 4681 and the Excel workbook as well. Now, the amount of the debt. Uh, that can be excluded using this insolvency uh, exception cannot exceed the amount of your insolvency. So in other words, however much your liabilities exceed your assets, that is the cap on the amount of debt that you're going to be able to exclude from your income. So in some cases it's, it's greater and you can exclude everything, and in other cases it's a smaller margin and so you can only exclude some of that debt. Now, once you use these debts and exclude them from income, you have to reduce your basis in your personal property or other tax attributes. So what that means is if you want to exclude the canceled debt income from your taxable income, you have to reduce the basis in your other assets, right? Your house, your car, uh, your furniture, your clothes, all those other items. And so we'll look at that uh, when we get to the insolvency worksheet. Now, let's look at the fact pattern here. So we have John Taxpayer. He has $3,600 of credit card debt that was canceled by the credit card company. Now, John did not declare bankruptcy. He just managed to work this out through the credit card company. And so before the debt cancellation, his total debts were $27,310, and the total fair market value of his assets was $20,510. Now, after completing the insolvency worksheet, he determines that he is insolvent, right? And that's because his debts are greater than his assets. So he goes ahead and completes the insolvency worksheet and the Form 982. So if we quickly look at the 1099-C, just to cover a few points here. So information is pretty straightforward, right? It, the date that the debts were canceled, the amount of income, uh, sorry, not the amount of debt on the credit card that was discharged is in box two. And then if this amount includes any accrued and unpaid interest, uh, the creditor should report that interest in box three as well. So you don't add these two together. What they're saying here is that of the $3,600, we've already included $1,020 in interest. Debt description there, 
you know, credit card expenditures and the balance due. And yes, the, the debtor here was personally liable for those debts. So now if we have a look at the 982, the way this 982 works, you determine how you're going to be excluding the debt up here in part one. So in our case, it's going to be 1B, discharge of indebtedness, because we're insolvent. And so we check that box, and then we enter on line two the amount of debt that we're going to be excluding from our income. Uh, so remember, $3,600 is the total on that 1099C, and we want to exclude the $3,600 amount, but we don't enter this amount until we complete that insolvency worksheet. So here's the insolvency worksheet that we've put together. Now the IRS publication 4681 has a good example as well. So if you scroll on down uh, a couple pages into the document, seven or eight pages, they have an insolvency worksheet. So you can list uh, the, all your liabilities immediately before the cancellation. You list all of your assets, the fair market value immediately before the cancellation, and then you determine whether or not you are insolvent at the bottom based on whether your liabilities exceed the fair market value of your assets. So let's have a look at the worksheet that we put together, which uh, reports all the, the same details. It's just a little easier to work with in Excel. So we have the date discharge was September 30th, so we're measuring the fair market values on that date. So these are the debts that John has. He has three credit cards, and a student loan balance there. And so the total debts before the cancellation was $27,310. $3,600, this is the credit card that's being, the credit card debt that was discharged, okay? So we've got 3,600 that's gonna be canceled. All in, we're at 27,310 on that date of discharge. Now the assets, list all the assets you have. Uh, so we've got uh, cash in his bank account the fair market value of his vehicle, the fair market value of his computer, household furniture and fixtures, uh, books, iPhone, uh, John rents, he does not own a home, so the, the security deposit he has with the landlord is an asset, $1,000. So we list all those items on the fair market value column, and then on the basis column, we list John's cost basis, so his original basis in these assets. Now with things like non-depreciable property, so cash, uh, rental deposits, these things, whatever your fair market value is, is generally the basis, so it's the same. But with all, with all these other items, you're normally gonna have a different amount, right? So John paid $11,000 for his vehicle, but now it's only worth 7,400, right? He paid $5,000 for various types of clothing, but now all of it's worth four grand maybe. And so you have to do that for each asset. Once you have all that information input in, you've got your total assets, total debts, you, so your insolvency is the excess of those debts over your assets. So John is insolvent to the tune of $6,800. Now the amount of debts that being, is being discharged here is $3,600. So the amount of debt that is being discharged cannot exceed the amount of your insolvency. That's generally uh, the way this works. So because the amount of debt is less, John is going to be able to exclude all $3,600. So none of this is going to be taxable because he's able to exclude all of it. He doesn't have to record in taxable income any amount. Now the example I have uh, in the description below covers a prior year scenario where there was a taxable portion and that's because the insolvency amount was lower than the debt discharge. So if you want to see an example of where that happens, uh, go check out that video below. So once we have the amount excluded, we report that amount up on line two. So this is the amount that's being excluded from gross income. All right. Now line uh, three, uh, are you electing to treat all the real property Describe in section 1221 uh, as if it were depreciable. Well, in our case, uh, we don't have any real property, period, right? So this question is moot for us, so we've just left it blank. Now, in part two, the reduction in ta tax attributes, uh, this is where we start to uh, let the IRS know, okay, how much of our uh, basis and our tax attributes are going to be reduced given the debt exclusion. So in this case, we use line 10A, right? We are reducing the basis of our non-depreciable and depreciable property that was not reduced on line five. 
Line five is an election that can be made. This is often made if you have business use property where you can first reduce the basis uh, to that depreciable property first and then you move on to the other tax attributes. So you would apply to the uh, that, that business use or investment use property first, then you move on to things like NOLs, capital loss carryovers, credits, things like that. In our case, none of this happens to us because we don't have any real property. We don't have any business property. We don't have any net operating losses. We don't have any general business credits. And so in John's case, which is, this is frankly the more common scenario, none of this applies. So we can just go straight to line 10A uh, where we're adjusting the basis of our property in the order prescribed in the publication, right, and under the regulations. So why do we use a $2,500 amount? Well, the basis reduction isn't necessarily the amount that's going to be excluded. It's the lesser of three amounts. So when we look at our line 10A amount, it's the lesser of our basis in the personal use property. So this is depreciable personal use property at the end of the year or the start of next year. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at these highlighted items here. So what's the basis in uh, this kind of property? 21,950, well, that's quite a large number. So we're looking for the lesser of. The, or the non-business debt that's being excluded. So we had $3,600 of business debt being excluded. Or the last computation is the excess of your basis in all the property. So all this property, basis, whatever the excess is over the debts remaining after the cancellation. Uh, so the debts remaining after the cancellation are these three items here. So credit card two, three, and a student loan. So this value this adds up to be 23,710 and so if we subtract 23,710 from 26,210 we're left with $2,500 so $2,500 is going to be the maximum amount of uh, basis reduction that we're required to make so once we've established that $2,500 in uh, basis is going to be the reduction there then we move on to allocate this uh, to the property type that we have. So if we look back at our worksheet here, the basis is allocated to uh, that depreciable property, right? So we have these items that are highlighted are the depreciable assets. We wouldn't allocate a basis reduction to things like cash or other kind of cash equivalents, right? Like security deposits. So the way we allocate the $2,500 is pro rata uh, based on the basis amount. So for example, if we look at the calculation here, we have uh, we add up all of these amounts. So this is the total amount of basis that we're going to be allocating across. And if we look at the allocation for, let's say, the vehicle, we take the vehicle's basis divided by the total times the uh, amount that we're reducing it uh, as a whole. And then we're left with uh, the $1,254 figure. So as, as long as you allocate each item, uh, pro rata to each basis, then the total allocation should match up to be $2,500, right? So that's what we've got here. So we've allocated this all appropriately. And so now our adjusted basis in these assets are the original basis minus the basis reduction is the adjusted basis. So what this means in effect is if John were to later sell one of these assets, when he goes to compute his gain or loss, if any, he has to use the adjusted basis figure, not his original. So if John bought this vehicle for 11,000 and he wanted to sell it back for 11,000 exactly, he would actually have a taxable gain because his adjusted basis is now 9,746, all right? And so this basis reduction is done uh, at the start of next year. So 2023, the debts are canceled, but under section uh, 1017A, this reduction is applied at the beginning of the tax year following the year the debt was discharged, okay? So if we look back at the 982, we've got our $2,500 figure there. Uh, part three doesn't apply to us because we, we don't need any corporate consent for these purposes. Uh, and then so the last item that we do is include uh, a footnote a schedule for 982 line 10a details now this isn't required actually for the 982 line 10a it is required on line 5 so if you're making this election for line 5 you must attach these kind of statements but 
Uh, I think it's good to attach a statement like this just to be clear to the user uh, what's happening here to the basis of these assets. So we've uh, summarized the schedule here of the, pers the depreciable personal property. Uh, so the vehicle again, for example, original basis, basis reduction, and now the adjusted basis. So we can see how the basis reductions are applying across all these different assets. All right, so that covers it for this video. I hope that was helpful. Oh, actually, sorry, one more thing to touch on. Uh, the Schedule 1 is where we would normally be reporting any taxable amount of cancellation of debt income. So in Part 1, uh, Line 8C here, the cancellation of debt income, in this case, the line item is zero because although we had $3,600 of COD income reported to us, we are excluding the full amount from our income, and so that's why we're seeing a zero value on uh, Schedule 1. All right. Okay, so that uh, covers it for this video. Again, thanks for watching, and as always, appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you.